Hey everybody and welcome to another craft seminar. Um, just to give you guys a quick update, Lily and I have kind of decided to move these to the video format since a lot of people seem to have a little bit of a harder time getting to the reading on Sunday. So we figured this might be easier to do um, in kind of a more colloquial format. And if we still want to join on Sundays and talk about what we're discussing here, we totally can. So one of my favorite definitions of hybridity actually comes from Marcellus Sulak in uh, the collection Family Resemblances, which is put out by Rose Metal Press. Um, it's actually a anthology of hybrid um, texts, actually with explanations by the author and what makes them hybrid. And it's really interesting cross-genre approaches to how to write. And uh, what we find is that a lot of these approaches aren't new at all. People have been doing these for decades. And when we look at, back at older writing, which we might have just, you know, kind of thrown the label of fiction or nonfiction on, what they're really doing is braiding uh, different techniques to create a hybrid work. And back to what Marcel Sulek actually defines as hybridity is really interesting because it's something that I believe James Baldwin does pointedly here. And that definition is that hybridity is an act of perception that is aware of itself as an act of perception. Now, what I take that to mean, and at least what it means to me, um, and by the way, I should just qualify that this is the specific definition she uses for lyric narrative or rather a lyric essay. Um, but it's something that I find to be kind of more generally applicable to all of hybridity. But what I really take that to mean is that it is a writing in linguistics that is both informed by the narrative techniques that make it up as much as it is impacting the reader through those narrative techniques. So it's not only a piece of writing that is aware of itself as a piece of writing, but it's a piece of writing that is both acknowledging what it's doing within and without the piece. And by he does that largely by contrasting things, by utilizing non-typical narrative formats uh, like what we're going to discuss today, a poetic abstraction, um, a non-fictive use of summary, and then a really specific employment of the narrative dream, um, which is kind of this James Gardner ideal that comes way after Sonny's Blues. Um, but we'll talk about all those in a couple seconds. Anyways, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about who James Baldwin was. James Baldwin was born in 1924 in New York City. He was the son of a revivalist minister and was raised in poverty in Harlem, where, at the age of 14, he became a preacher in the Fireside Pentecostal Church. After completing high school, he decided to become a writer and, with the help of the black American expatriate writer Richard Wright, won a grant that enabled him to move to Paris, where he lived for most of his remaining years. There, he wrote the critically acclaimed Go Tell It on a Mountain, a novel about the religious awakening of a 14-year-old black youth. His subsequent works included Giovanni's Room, Another Country, um, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, If Beale Street Can Talk, and many, many others. Uh, the work we're going to be discussing today is Sonny's Blues. It was actually in James Baldwin's first collection of published short fiction and originally appeared in The Partisan. Um, it's a beautiful short story, and the short story itself, uh, just for a little background, focuses around a pair of brothers, one of the brothers being Sonny and the other brother being the narrator. And the narrator himself um, is a first-person individual who is relaying the story to us. What the narrator chooses to do is to tell the story of his brother and how his brother um, has this intermingling experience with both jazz music and drug use. So instead of telling you more about Sonny's Blues, what I figured we would do is we would just hop right into reading some of it. Um, I wanted to start from the beginning because when we were discussing kind of those elements of hybridity, um, that really specific use and employment of disassociating image from object, uh, which is a very poetic thing that they do within lines, within stanzas, um, to create a greater meaning within the image and the subject is something that James Baldwin actually uses and employs right in the beginning. And it's actually almost a, something that I found is a, a, an aspect of larger hybrid texts. Um, you can look at a couple of other places that do it. Maggie Nelson with Bluettes, um, Department of Speculation, Jenny Ophel. One of my personal favorites is definitely this uh, usage of the deer head mounted on a wall and on Earth for Briefly, Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, where he talks about the difference in perception and actually the ideals of what that imagined perception are. Literally actually kind of taking Sulak's definition and kind of breaking it open more and like actually examining it in a really interesting way, even though that was manuscripts were being written at the same time. So they probably didn't influence each other that directly. Um so I'll go ahead and start reading this, and uh, we'll look into this kind of for that poetic abstraction. Um, and I'll start right from that first page right here. It's on the uh, uwm.edu uh, link. It should be in the comments of wherever this video is, if not in the comments or the description of the video itself. If not, just type in Sunny's Blues PDF. There's a ton of them online. So I'll go ahead and start here. 
I read about it in the paper. In the subway on my way to work, I read it and I couldn't believe it and I read it again. Then perhaps I just stared at it. At the newsprint spelling out his name, spelling out the story, I stared at it in the swinging lights of the subway car, in the faces and bodies of the people, and in my own face, trapped in the darkness which roared outside. It was not to be believed that I kept telling myself that as I walked from the subway station to the high school. At the same time, I couldn't doubt it. I was scared, scared for Sonny. He became real to me again. A great block of ice settled in my belly and kept melting there slowly all day long while I taught my classes algebra. It was a special kind of ice. It kept melting, sending trickles of ice water all up and down my veins, but it never got less. Sometimes it hardened and seemed to expand until I felt my guts were going to come spilling out or that I was going to choke or scream. This would always be at a moment when I was remembering some specific things Sonny had once said or done. What I really adore about this passage is um, like we were talking about the kind of abstraction of language. And he does it twice, actually, in this first opening paragraph. So what he does is he takes the idea of um, kind of reading that story on the subway train and he projects it outward. Um, Hawthorne really actually argues for this, which is the projection of ideal outward. Like when you see your dresser kind of draped in moonlight, it's much spookier than if it's just sitting there kind of in the middle of day. And what Baldwin really does is he takes that ideal, which is both a fictional ideal and a poetic ideal. And what he does is he breaks it by allowing the ideals to be shared universally in that doom in which he's seeing. So it allows us to both look outward and inward at the same time. Again, an active perception that is aware of itself as an active perception. Uh, something else that I think this story does very well is it works very well in the reread. Um, it's a, a story that I feel like is meant to be read multiple times, first of all, because of its length, and second of all, because of just the density of the language. Because um, when you read it in the second time, especially in light of how the father's brother was killed with the light of um, the car kind of bathing his body in the moonlight, or rather the moonlight bathing his body on the road, um, is definitely reflected. Again, in the swinging lights of subway cars and the faces and bodies of the people and in my own face trapped in the darkness. Um, this really cool reflective use of language is used. And what that breakdown does is it allows us to, again, see the universality and the specific. This really beautiful way that James Baldwin actually is utilizing language in a directly hybrid form to create that kind of greater meaning. Um, it's something we can do in our own work very easily, but what you just need to do is find an image or a central uh, concept or kind of turning point motion in your novel or, or rather fictional story or poem or anything and find a way to kind of break that and put it out to the world I've actually done this inversely in the uh second part which is to take this kind of piece of news which is of course sonny's arrest over being a heroin addict um out to the world and he actually internalizes it he puts it again this thing that was put outward to the world he then takes it and puts it back in um, it was a special kind of ice. It kept melting, sending trickles of ice water all up and down my veins, but it never got less. Sometimes it hardened and seemed to expand until I felt my guts were going to come spilling out. Um, this really beautiful embracing of metaphor, although none of these things are happening directly true um, in real life. These are not actual elements of the fictional dream or really elements of establishing plot or uh, successive action to build meaning. Uh, what they're doing is actually disambiguating um, disambiguating ideals so that we are both centered in concrete emotion and thought um, and it's a really beautiful way again of both knowing what what your language is doing purposefully and purposefully employing that language to build a larger meaning within the confines of the story which I think he really does uh, just gorgeously in this opening section one of the other really bold uses of hybrid elements is kind of the accepting of uh, the non fictive explanation or rather the telling of things. Um, I was actually talking with somebody who had attended one of the earlier workshops about showing versus telling. Um, and it's not necessarily an aspect of um, really even having balance. It's more of asking what the story needs in the moment. And I think that at the bottom of page 129, again, following that PDF near on page four, uh, we get a good summary of Sonny in review um, that really casts him as his own person, but also doesn't talk down to him. And doesn't do any of this in scene. In a fiction story, these are things that, you know, we might have marked up in workshop and said, I'd like to see this played out, or this is something that might have more effect on the, um, rather on the screen or on the page. But what I think Baldwin does is he implicitly takes that and he kind of subverts it to say, no, I'm going to give you the information, again, perceived through this filtration of the first person narrator, which is a person who cannot understand Sonny implicitly. 
Um, and he says, I'm going to give you this and I'm going to make you see it this way because this is how it should be. It's a specific act, again, through perception. So I'll pick up there uh, towards the bottom of 129, again, at the bottom of page four, if you're looking on the PDF. Uh, Sonny has never been talkative, so I don't know why I was sure he'd be dying to talk to me when supper was over the first night. Everything went fine. The oldest boy remembered him, and the youngest boy liked him, and Sonny would remember to bring something for each of them. And Isabel, who was really much nicer than I am, more open and giving, had gone to a lot of trouble about dinner and was genuinely glad to see him. And she has always been able to tease Sonny in a way that I haven't. It was nice to see her so vivid again, to hear her laugh and watch her make Sonny laugh. She wasn't, or anyway, didn't seem to be at all uneasy or embarrassed. She chatted as though there were no subject which had to be avoided, and she got Sonny past his first faint stiffness. And thank God she was there, for I filled with, for I was filled with that icy dread again. Everything I did seemed awkward to me, and everything I said sounded frighted, uh, sound fr freighted with hidden meaning, rather. Um, I was trying to remember everything I'd heard about dope addiction, and I couldn't help watching Sonny for signs. I wasn't doing it out of malice. I was trying to find out something about my brother. I was dying to hear me tell him he was safe. It's really gorgeous. Again, a summary of scene. Uh, what I enjoy about this, uh, re really this whole story is that the action on the page is actually quite small. Really what you get is our narrator talking to a child they grew up with who breaks the news about Sonny to him, him driving Sonny home, him and Sonny having a discussion before uh, the actual show of the night and then the show of the night. And that is all of the actual physical action that happens within the confines of the story. So what I think is really beautiful about the story is that they actually step back, uh, or rather James Baldwin steps back, and allows the summary to both fill in, but not feel like it's uh, needed and seen. So all the information that you're being given, all the information that specifically is supposed to be imparted uh, to the reader, it's not done uh, just in a way that feels heavy-handed or full full of dialogue or fake in a way that we kind of have to, you know, set scenes sometimes to make them work. Just by having this really quick summary and telling people what happened instead of being obsessed with the showing allows, again, the perception, the filtration of Sonny being the person saying what happened and his insecurities and anxieties driving that, the active perception aware of, his, aware of itself as active perception, uh, really pushes that use of summary to something that's doing two or three things at once um, that may at first glance not be uh, something that you really recognize as a very specific craft choice. One of the last things I want to look at is kind of how uh, James Baldwin, as a nonfiction writer, really embraces uh, this concept and use within the story of the narrative dream. The last place I'm going to look at here is actually, and I get torn on this every time I talk about this, because when I talk about the fictional dream, it's used in uh, Sonny's Blues. I always want to go for the last scene, which is uh, the beautiful jazz scene. It's one of the most beautiful music scenes read in, in all of literature. But there's actually a more subtle scene that um, kind of in more recent years I've been really coming back to is just like a master class of this. And this is this large paragraph. It's Sonny's kind of, I want to say monologue, but his longer response to his brother. It's beautiful on page 144, page 12 of the PDF. Um, I'll start it. He smiled. He smiled, but sat sideways on the sofa, his elbow resting on the back, his fingers playing with his mouth and chin, not looking at me. I've been something I didn't realize, I didn't recognize, didn't know I could be, didn't know anybody could be. He stopped looking inward, looking helplessly young, looking old. I'm not talking about it now because I feel guilty or anything like that. Maybe it would be better if I did. I don't know. Anyway, I can't really think about it. Not to you, not to anybody. And now he turned and faced me. Sometimes, you know, and it was actually when I was the most out of the world, I felt I was in it, that I was with it, really. And I could play, now I didn't really have to play. It just came out of me. It was there. And I don't know how I played, thinking about it now. But I know I did awful things those times, sometimes, to people. Or it wasn't that I did anything to them. It was that they weren't real. He picked up his beer can. It was empty. He rolled it between his palms. And other times, well, I needed a fix. I needed to find a place to lean. I needed to clear a space to listen. And I couldn't find it. And I went crazy. I did terrible things to me. I did terrible for me. He began pressing the beer can between his hands and watched the metal begin to give. It glittered as he played with it like a knife 
and I was afraid he would cut himself, but I said nothing. Oh well, I can never tell you. I was all by myself at the bottom of something, stinking and sweating and crying and shaking, and I smelled it, you know, my stink, and I thought I'd die if I couldn't get away from it, and yet, all the same, I knew that everything I was doing was just locking me in with it. And I didn't know, he paused, still flattening the beer can. I didn't know, I still don't know, something kept telling me that maybe it was good to smell your own stink, but I didn't think that that was what was what I had been trying to do, and who can stand it? And he abruptly dropped the ruined beer can, looking at me with a small, still smile, and then rose, walking to the window as though it were the uh, lodestone rock. I watched his face. He watched the avenue. I couldn't tell uh, you when Mama died, but the reason I wanted to leave Harlem so bad was to get away from drugs. And then when I ran away, that's what I was running from, really. When I came back, nothing had changed. I hadn't changed. I was just older. And he stopped, drumming his fi with his fingers on the window pane. The sun had vanished. Soon darkness would fall. I watched his face. It can come again, he said, almost as though speaking to himself. Then he turned to me. It can come again, he repeated. I just want you to know that. All right, I said at last. So it can come again. All right. Um, it's this really beautiful, like, I just, like, I always get, like, worked up reading that again because it's this really beautiful admission on Sonny's part that, um, his illness isn't something that necessarily will ever go away, um, or something that necessarily should ever go away. And what I really adore about this is the way that James Baldwin uh, intercuts this monologue with the action. It's it's a really, truly a, a beautiful fictional dream because you can see somebody having this emotional dialogue and breaking up through these small stage directions. And now he turned and faced me. He picked up the beer can. It was empty. He rolled it between his palms. He began pressing the beer can between his pans. I watched the metal begin to give. It glittered as he played with it like a knife. And I was afraid he would cut himself, but I said nothing. You get these really beautiful moments that are uh, completely of the fictional dream. These are all things that are happening both within the narrator's mind that are relational to the physical world. Um, but what's happening is uh, they're allowed to take on greater meaning because they're delivered within this context of the larger kind of dialogue breakdown. Um, and it's just a beautiful movement of the fictional dream. But again, um, what I think we're kind of getting at throughout this whole thing is that none of these individual elements work disparately of each other. Hybrid narrative kind of works as um, a greater system because the system relies on every individual part building up to something greater. Not just the fictional dream that he does so well both at the end of this story, which if we had time, I would just read the whole thing for 45 minutes. Um, or, you know, what he does with the beer can or several other places when he's talking about descriptions. Or when he actually goes into that non-fictive summary where he can cover so much memory and time and elapsed emotion without having to show it on the scene and on the actual uh, scene. Or when we go back to that poetic abstraction of language, which actually does come back in this section a little bit towards the end. The sun had vanished. Soon darkness would fall. I watched his face. Again, the um, consumption of both light and darkness on faces like we talk about with the body in the moonlight. What we talk about with the beginning where he's seeing the news story sprayed across all these other uh, faces that look like his and look like Sonny's on the bus. Um, this really beautiful mentioning again where the image is allowed to again come back around. So again, that perception actually cycling back is almost a mirror upon itself. Um, this is uh, Sonny's Blues is probably like I always tell people it's it's more American than Gatsby, hands down. It's probably the best American short story uh, for my money besides Barrel Fever, um, which I would put it for ties. That is by um, David Sedaris, which is absolutely beautiful. Out of a small press, uh, that collection is called Barrel Fever. Out of Back Bay Press, which is actually just south, North Carolina, of us here in Norfolk, Virginia, at uh, ODU. Anyways, I'm Tim Norton again. Um, I guess uh, next time I might do an introduction for myself. But uh, I hope you guys had a great time talking a little bit more about uh, Sunny's Blues and the hybrid elements that I see within the text. Um, whether or not you agree with me, you most certainly do not have to. And we can most certainly talk about it if you'd like to. I always uh, enjoy really finding out uh, different perspectives on literature. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'll probably have one of these up again next week, and we'll be talking about Otessa Moshvig's My Year of Rest and Relaxation. Um, and I kind of want to look at the first chapter of that especially, because what she does in that first chapter is really uh, show you how to make a mean narrator drive a plot. 
And I, I like meanness a lot in uh, texts. I think actually in this one specifically, Sonny's Blues also has a very mean narrator in general. So uh, that's a really beautiful thing to kind of think about as we go to next week as well. These harsh people whom we may not like, but who really do have this kind of um, instinctive authorial power over a narrative. Anyways, I'll, I'll leave you there. Thank you so much. Hope to see you guys next week. Bye.